Welcome, everybody. We are in uh, 10 Parables on uh, Chapter 7, Hope and Tar Water tonight. Going to be uh, following the discussion led by Brad Hurst. Brad, thanks for all the preparations that you put into this. I know that it's been many weeks and a lot of time you put into it, and I appreciate that. I'm really looking forward to it tonight. I'll turn it over to you and uh, take it away. Thanks, Cameron. Um, <clears throat> You know, like you said, I, I've thought about this one um, long and hard. I'm fairly new to all this stuff. Um, just a quick introduction to my, I, I know there's a lot of you out there that I don't know, uh, that don't know me. Um, my wife and I started on this path probably about, oh golly, what, a year and a half ago? Um, <clears throat> And uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a fire hose of information out there um, <laughs> regarding the restoration of the gospel. And, uh, you know, so much that in my, in my preparation for this presentation, I felt inspired, um, starting with a good friend who, who offered some um, suggestions of, of things that it meant to, to her. And, um, and I, I, I went down this path of involving a lot of close friends in asking their input. And, and in a couple of situations, I sat down with some friends and we read the parable and we just, or just discussed the parable a little bit. And, um, and so because <laughs> of that style of preparation, there are a lot of different uh, thoughts running around my head. And so I kind of just wanted to take, I, I do have some things uh, prepared, some, some thoughts, some quotes that I pulled, some scriptures, but I think that I just want to start out by reading, you know, uh, the first little piece of that and then, and then kind of go in from there. And, and opening it up for a little bit of discussion, and then I'll, I'll you know, point out some things that, that, that have hit me in preparing for this. So, um, <clears throat> we're going to start here uh, by just reading the first four paragraphs, and I want to pay attention, kind of comparing and contrasting these two towns, right, Hope and Tarwater. Two towns bordered a woodland. Each of the towns had a tradition about the woods. In the one it was said, the woods are dangerous and many things there can hurt you. The animals include the mountain lion and wild boar, which have been known to injure many a man. And the bear, which has killed many a man. As the course of civilization develops, the woods are always subdued and tamed. The wild things are domesticated and the dangerous are killed. In time, the woods become a backyard, no longer threatening to humanity. In the other, it was said, the woods are beautiful and many things there can surprise you with their loveliness. The animals include the bluebird and chipmunk, which have been known to sing for hours, and the wild deer, which has inspired many a painter and poet. As the course of civilization develops, the woods are always subdued and tamed. The wild beauty is domesticated and many lovely creatures are killed. In time, the woods become a backyard, no longer providing humanity with rare scenes of wild beauty. <clears throat> Actually, I wanna take it, uh, two more paragraphs and then we'll, we'll stop for discussion. Um, can I get a volunteer to read those two paragraphs? Maybe Jill Van Heron. <laughs> Do you have the book? Uh, who's got it? John, you got it there handy? No, but I'll smack her for not having it. Maybe, maybe John Dudson. Looks like he's got it there. <laughs> right. Okay, it looks like, Jill, did you get it? Okay, go for it. I was just enjoying your 
your voice. Okay, paragraphs five and six. The first town was named. The first town was named Tarwater for an explorer who had survived there against all odds. He came in winter. He had to find warmth, food, and shelter while battling the elements. He felled trees, built a cabin, and burned trees for warmth, which he cleared from around his homestead. He slew animals to eat and kept their hides for clothing. The second was named Hope for a woman who raised her children there against all odds. She came in summer, settled in a meadow, and found everything she needed to survive in or on the land. She placed her tent beside a hot spring, which provided her warmth in the, warm, in the cold weather. She ate berries and wild fruit and found pine nuts plentiful. She was able to weave the flax growing beside her stream and made linen clothing for herself and for her children. Okay, let's let's pause there. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's interesting um, that that it's the same wood, and you have two towns with two almost completely different traditions, right? Um, what's interesting is if you look at, at both of their viewpoints, it's not that one is wrong and one is right, right? Uh, so, for example, right, the people of Tarwater said the woods are dangerous. Can the woods be dangerous? Yeah. And the people of Hope say the wild, um, the woods are beautiful and many things there can surprise you with their loveliness. That's also true. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's interesting, you know, and, and as you read the the story of the founders of those towns, um, you, you start to experience or you start to understand how each of those traditions um, grew, right? Um, <clears throat> how, you know, the, the word, you know, the word tradition just makes me think of, um, you know, in the Book of Mormon, how many times does it mention the, you know, the phrase, the traditions of their fathers? Um, what, what, what are your guys' thoughts on, on kind of the, the introduction to those two towns? Um, and I'm kind of open to take this out wherever you guys want to take it. So, so what's anyone's thoughts on, on these two traditions? I have some thoughts, Brad. What, what would they maybe symbolize, Gary? It's interesting how when she came, she set up her tent, Right. And, and expecting the hot spring to warm her in the winter. So that was a, that's a temporary thing. She, it's almost as if she knew how long she'd be there. It wouldn't be a long-term thing. It, it, he, it, yeah, he that, came in the winter and built, chopped down a bunch of trees and built a semi-permanent structure with the intent of staying for a long time. Yeah, it's interesting that with Mother Hope, uh, she... She, kind of, she looked ahead and knew that winter would come even though she arrived in, in summer. Um, so uh, what, what are some other thoughts? I had some things I want to read, um, but, but what are some other thoughts there? Um, hey, Brad? Yeah. I don't know if anybody else Googled tar water, but there was an interesting... Uh, uh, Something I found that was interesting when I Googled tar water, there's actually a thing. Uh, and also, you know, if you kind of, I've, I've noticed that when you look at these parables, there's certain key words that can kind of clue you to a, a different meaning or a different perspective on looking at these things. So I tend to sort of pick out words that are unusual and try to kind of go into the meaning of them. But I'd like to read this meaning of tar water and I, I also looked up the the uh, definition of hope in the glossary of the scriptures, 
And that I thought was a really good explanation of what we should think of as hope in this parable as well. So if you want to read that, that definition, great. I think it's worth our time, but I, yeah. I just have this on my iPhone. If somebody can Google that. And those are two things I looked at as well. And so, yeah, let's go ahead and explore those two things. Right. Oh, well, let me read this, what I have on my iPhone and you can deal with the hope part of it. I'll deal with the tar water part. Okay. Um, tar water or pine tar water is actually a medieval remedy one drank to rid himself or herself from particularly strong spirits or entities. Now, while it's not offered as much due to its disagreeable taste, those who practice the craft use tar water as a symbol in their practices to aid in banishing evil or negative entities in themselves or in their presence. While our protection spray, these people actually sell it. It's twelve dollars and fifty cents a bottle. If anybody needs to buy any of that, they sell it on Amazon. <laughs> so while our protection spray can ward off everyday negativity, and we probably need a lot of that, and protect against developing attachments, our tar water spray is ideal for more severe cases. So I thought that was fairly interesting. And what I took from that is this tar water place. Sounds like it may have some more negative connotations or more evil, uh, uh, less less righteous or less spiritual beings associated with it. That's that's just what I took from it. And I'll leave the hope part to you. It's interesting that you bring that up because I, I had that first thought when I read that. Well, this is like this nasty thing, but then you look at it and they used it as a remedy. So I'm like, in that light, it might be a good thing. And what's interesting is, is how many times in these parables, there's a, there's a couple of come to mind that we've talked about pine trees specifically. I know that the, um, the old tree, right, was talking about a twisted pine tree. And then we have this word tar water that comes, you know, one of the, the definitions is this, <clears throat> you know, pine tar or pine sap uh, mixed with water. And so it's just kind of an odd thing to think about. Yeah, could the, could the ponderosa pine be a remedy for the, the evil as well? Interesting, yeah. Um, hey, Brad. Yeah. yeah. I had a thought about that too. With the sap from the tree would be pure. And when you mix water with it, it's no longer pure. It's It's been contaminated, so to speak, diluted. Um, and perhaps that has something to do with this town operating by fear and having diluted the... <laughs> the 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 traditions or the you know i'm sure at one point they were had learned that there were good things but over time they allowed this this fear to start i don't know to to dilute their faith and i it, it it's an interesting um yeah i had not i had not looked up what tar water meant but that's a very interesting uh What's the word I'm looking for? Comparison or name <laughs> that he chose? Yeah, it, I think it's something to consider. Um, I, you know, I haven't in my own mind completely, uh, you know, you know, had the light bulb of exactly what that might mean. It might mean a, a few different things. As you know, this is a parable, and there's going to be multiple layers of meaning there. Um, before we get a before we get deeper um, into this, I want to read something. You know, as I mentioned, these parables are going to have multiple layers of meaning, um, and I it's to the it's up to the reader and you know in, in study and contemplation. But uh, you know, in, in in reading what Denver said about his parable, it's it's interesting that even in his mention of it, he mentions two different meanings or viewpoints of what this parable can mean. And this is a, a quote from the talk, The Mission of Elijah Reconsidered. <clears throat> Denver said this about this parable. 
In 10 parables, there is a story of hope and tar water, which, by the way, is a parable that has multiple meanings. But the intended, intended meaning is that both hope and tar water are the pre-existence. But you run with that when you read it. Tonight, what it's about is the attitude that you bring with you. You bring it from the pre-existence, but the attitude that you bring with you to anything. So we'll, we'll pause there. He says a few, a few more things about the parable. But. So, you know, the, the, the first few times that, that I read this, I, I looked at it from the viewpoint of you get what you expect. You find what you expect. Um, it, it, as we read further into this, um, Lance, the tradition of tar water that Lance brings with him into the wood, um, he expected to find danger and he found danger. Um, James expected to have a lovely experience in the wood and he had a lovely experience in the wood. So as we dive deeper into this, let's we can look at both of those meanings, but the one that I think is the intended, what Denver said, the intended meaning that I want to talk about a little bit is what does it mean that hope and tar water are the pre-existence? So that's in talking about these two towns that border the wood. So if hope and tar water are the pre-existence, then what would the wood represent? So I'd like to open that up for a little bit of uh, conversation. So to me, the wood then is our existence now. Our mortal existence? Yeah, and um, when, when, it, when it mentions, or when Denver mentions that both of these are scenarios that could be in the pre-existence, I think that there's an extension of that. I think that our existence is an extension of the pre-existence. There are two, two different options here that are that are presented, right? There are there are two plans. There's one that include that in, that involves a significantly higher amount of danger. There is one that has less danger and is more an experience of of peace and observance. Uh, in one, I mean, in, in both of these, um, the paragraph two and paragraph four, they talk about in time the woods become a backyard. It, it doesn't matter if the existence is that of hope or that of tar water, the end result ultimately will return back to the same place. The woods will be subdued and uh, will become a backyard. In one sense, it's no longer threatening to humanity, meaning a savior has been provided. And in the other sense, there there is no longer the uh, rare scenes of wild beauty. Um, so the, the, the period of observance has passed. So that's what I take out of that. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, I had, uh, you know, that where both become a backyard, right? That it's kind of an interesting concept that there, there's a time allotted for the mortal experience, right? Um, other, other thoughts about hope and tar water representing uh, the pre-existence and the wood representing our mortal experience here. <clears throat> has, has someone thought about that maybe a little bit differently or want to expand upon that train of thought? I John? Thought that, in, that both of these uh, approaches to life, one, you could, they're uh, both happening here on the, at the same time in the same place because they both saw each other on the edge of the meadow. So they're both here in the same woods at the same time experiencing two completely different things. And if you look at this life, one of the things that always used to frustrate me is, you know, the life of some kid born and raised in East LA or some guy that was born, you know, in the Amazon jungle versus my life. They're not even the same thing. They're not even the same thing at all. 
So I used to wonder why that seems so unfair. And when you, when you can um, apply an understanding that there was a preexistence that has carry over here, things start making so much more sense and a little bit easier to handle some of what you see as injustices and such. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thanks, John. Um, Terry, Ann, you have something to say? I, yeah. Um, with regard to our mortal existence, um, I was struck by the yeah the, these two existences are at the are happening at the same time simultaneously. Yet it's a matter of choice and expectation as to what comes out of it. Um, on the one hand, you can operate throughout your life based on fear and um, paranoia, negativity. Um, causing destruction in your path, <laughs> um, which ultimately leads to <coughs> not gaining anything, um, perhaps having to go out and hunt again for food again because you didn't find what you were looking for the first time, perhaps doing an eternal round over and over and over again. Um, the second is faith-based, where the children of Tarwater never enter the woods um, without bags and, and ways to reap from the harvest and reap from um, what the earth provides for their existence. And they don't kill, they, um, they yeah, they gather in the, what, what's on the earth um, and enhances their existence and they act in faith and um, don't allow fear to drive them and the outcome of that is vastly different than um, those who are driven by by fear they can't exist at the same time in the same person thanks Jerian. um I, the thought i had john you're gonna say something you're looking right at me buddy you're muted I was just checking you out, Brad. Thank you. Um, it, it, in reading this, I, I found it interesting that the founder of Tarwater was masculine and the founder of Hope was feminine. Um, I took this little uh, snippet from our divine parents from a uh, talk by Denver. And it says the father and the son are masculine and therefore personified by the word knowledge. So I started thinking about, you know, like I said before, the first couple of times when I read this, I was always like, well, tar water is just terrible, right? There, there's nothing good come out of tar water. But if you read it in this light and look at Lance's journey, maybe in a different light, you might find that it's not all negative and mucky tar water. So it says, the father and son are masculine and therefore personified by the word knowledge. The mother as well as the son's companion are feminine and personified by the word wisdom. These personifications reflect an eternal truth about these two parts of the one true God. Knowledge initiates. Wisdom receives, guides, and tempers. Knowledge can be dangerous unless it is informed by wisdom. Wisdom provides guidance and counsel to channel what comes from knowledge. These are eternal attributes, part of what it means to be a male or, fem or a female. Creation begins with the active initiative of knowledge, but order and harmony for the creation requires wisdom. Balance between them is required for an orderly creation to exist. <clears throat> yeah, any thoughts on that and how um, those definitions of, of the 
masculine and feminine divine might play into these two towns and the trains of thought there. So I was, I had a thought. Um, with these two existences essentially happening at the same time, the only reason that the hope side of the woods were bear free were because the bears had room to move over to the tar water side and had been there. And so really the only reason that they enjoy their, you know, um, safe existence over there is because there was a different place for them to go. It's, if, if it had just been, you know, a small wooded area, there still would have been bears and that would have been, that wouldn't have been the case. They had to coexist together in order for both of those environments to come to be. Um, and I thought it was very interesting that the, the hope side, there were paths that were used. So instead of having to go out and find your own way, you used the wisdom that you had to follow the paths of other people because you knew that those were the safe paths. At the same time, the tar water side, because they had to go out and find their own way and be wary of what was around them, they ended up, I think that Lance ended up learning more and gaining more knowledge from his experience than he would have if it had been um, a danger-free zone. So I think there's, there's a whole lot of knowledge and wisdom wrapped up in, in each side of this parable. Yeah, I, I, like, I like that idea that um, perhaps Lance's uh, walk into the woods was not, like I first thought, um, completely pointless. Um, he had an expectation. He had a hope. He actually mentions many times in Lance's journey that he, had, he was hopeful of certain things. Um, so it's interesting that it mentions that for a son of tar water to have hope in it. <clears throat> and I'm not, you know, gonna get this very correctly. And maybe someone with some more understanding of this could, can pipe in, but in talking with Adrian, a friend of mine, Adrian Larson, that you all might know, he was talking about, uh, yin and yang, how, right. You have you know, the dark color, black on one side, white on the other, but then you have um, dots on each one where, you know, the white will still contain a segment of, of, of the other and vice versa. And so it's more that there are pieces of those weaved in between them and they, and they create more of a balance. Maybe Jill would be able to explain that a little bit better. So that goes along the same same lines with yoga and harmony, right? It's it's the idea that you can't. I mean, if if hope and if tar water were um, perfect in themselves, we wouldn't have a story, right? There would be no parable. Mm -hmm. So, if if you have the masculine coming from tar water and the feminine coming from from hope, um, it is as though you need to have both aspects of what each experience and each town have to bring it more into harmony to, for the two greater parts of the whole. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You have to have, you have to have the balance and exactly like with what Adrian was saying that, that, and, and what you had just read from the divine parents talk. I think that like the last sentence you had said is something about two parts of of the great whole, right? Mm -hmm. So it is about bringing everything back into union. So, yeah. Along the same lines as that, um, it made me think of Western European civilization has been kind of male oriented, scientific, um, analytical conquering and you know even with science they want to conquer it and they want to and whereas it runs head on into native american culture here in the states which has always been more about harmony with not conquering the earth so much as harmony with it and um and we're all in the same country and yet it's like two different worlds happening 
I, li I like that comment, Marsha. I think, uh, you know, that, that hope and tar water, you know, even here, just in, in, in the American continent, right? Um, any other, any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, Brad, I, I go for it. Read something just really briefly here. We make a lot of assumptions as we read, and this is one of the interesting things about this. We assume a lot of things in Hope and Tar Water that are not actually said. Mm -hmm. And if you peel back your assumption and throw it away for a minute, in mm -hmm. other words, if you get rid of the tradition that you're bringing to the to the parable. Yeah, you look at what's actually said. Sometimes it's different than what you actually thought. So let's take a look at the first sentence. Mm -hmm. Two towns bordered a woodland. We automatically assume that it means the same wood. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the same woods. There were two towns and they both bordered a woodland. Doesn't mean that they bordered the same woodland or a single woodland. And the fact that we made that assumption, then later on, as we're reading through, when Lance sees this dim, man-like shadow off in the distance that he can't quite make out and it's carrying something, we make the assumption that that's uh, going to be um, uh, James, James, James in the forest uh, carrying that fawn. But doesn't actually say that. It doesn't say that. And then when we get later on, when we're reading the story of James, which is much shorter, and uh, we, James uh, has this same type of experience where off in the distance he thinks he sees uh, a hunter, but uh, we make the assumption that that's Lance. But the problem with that is because we've made these assumptions all the way along, we just kind of dismiss it. That's The thing is, though, if you take a deeper look at this, you find out that the timing involved doesn't work. That they didn't end, because it says they entered woods on the same day, but they couldn't have left the woods on the same day. And they couldn't have had their experiences at the same time. So these are different timelines, which means almost assuredly this must be different woods and therefore a different experience. And so if, if you look at it that way, maybe we at some point in our existence need to be like Lance. And maybe we, at some point in our existence, with a different cycle, need to be like James. And there are going to be different experiences. One kind of mortal existence will have one set of characteristics and a set of uh, maybe assumptions that we bring to the table when we get there. And that's how things have evolved in that particular uh, mortal existence. And then maybe at another time in another place, There'll be another town that borders a woodland, and when we have the opportunity to come out of that pre-existent world and into a mortality, it will be a totally different kind of experience. But in each of them, we have this sense that we remember a few things from the past, or we remember a few things from another cycle, or maybe we can see through the glass dimly in the distance something that we can make out, but we don't understand it and we make the assumption that it is something that maybe it's not. Yeah, that's, that's a, I, I really like that train of thought, Reed. Um, you know, I, I think reading these parables, you know, sometimes we make these assumptions and, and looking at it from a different perspective can give us more insight. Um, you know, what, one thing, uh, a question I have as you were talking, Reed, is, could it be possible too that maybe it's not the same wood or a certain, but maybe there's two towns still going into the same mortal existence at any given time, right? I may in this in this mortal existence, I came from tar water, but my wife might have been already from a different place, uh, from hope, and we might still be in the same mortal existence. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'm coming from a sort of a different slant on that myself as well. I consider it to be like my own life, like I've lived in my lifetime. Like in the beginning of my life, I was more in tar water. The end of my life, I, well, I don't know if I'm getting close to the end of it, but <laughs> uh, 
I hope so, this particular life. But, but in any case, um, the, the latter part I consider to be more like hope. Uh, and I consider the, the beginning part to have been filled with fear and, and uh, anxiety and uh, uh, doubt. And uh, I approached life much like Lance did. Uh, because, you know, Lance seemed to be doing everything his own way, following his own path. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I looked up the, the name, what it meant, Lance, and I think... It's, it's a weapon. I, I'll have to look it up and let you know in a minute. But I looked it up, and there's actually... Uh, James means follower, and I can't remember what Lance meant means at the moment, but I'll... I'll it's funny that a lance was used on Christ and it brought blood and water. But in any case, that's fogging up my, my plan to, to explain this. But in any case, I was more like Lance, full of fear, full of negative entities to some degree uh, at that time in my life. But, but now I follow the path because if you look at James, James followed the path. Lance just kind of jumped in there into the wilderness without a path. Uh, James had a path, and he followed the path. And um, James is the one that looked like he was not having, not experiencing the fear. He was not looking for mean animals in the wilderness. He was looking for birds singing. So I think, you know, looking or listening to Denver's last podcast, I think that is timed very well with this parable because it talks about um, being in the zone. And I think that James is in the zone. Mm -hmm. And I think that Lance is definitely not in the zone, but doesn't mean Lance can't find the zone at some point in time, but he's got a little bit of a long way to go in my view. Um, he's running through hiding from the bears and, you know, James is laid under a tree taking a nap. So, so I think that's the way the zone is. The zone is without fear, without doubt, maybe without not totally all of it, but without a lot of it, and um, confident that God is in control and God has got you and got you protected and he's taking care of you and he's letting you know what to do step by step. Therefore, you are kind of just zinging you're going right through the woods. You don't really care about anything, any danger because you know, if God wants you to be eaten by a coyote, let him go ahead and eat me. You know, it's okay. I'm okay with God letting a coyote eat me if that's what's supposed to happen to me. Otherwise I'm going to go through the, the forest without fear. Yeah. So I kind of look at it as myself before I, I align myself with Christ and after I align myself with Christ and that, to me, is is what our lives kind of may or should look like, possibly. I don't know. That's my thought on it. Thanks for that thought, Lisa. There, something I, I uh, uh, in in discussing this parable with a friend of mine, he, he pointed me um, to this uh, term in the glossary of terms. Uh, it's worlds without end. <clears throat> says, if men and women will receive what is offered now, they will be added upon forever and ever and forever. In other words, each person moves up the ladder by his or her heat and diligence in this cycle of creation. As they do, they will have so much the advantage in the next cycle. They can choose to move upward and be added upon or choose to remain as they are, worlds without end. Now is part of eternity. Though mortal, man lives in eternity and ought to take this opportunity seriously. The scriptures speak of things that happened before the foundation of the world, or in the first place, or from the foundation of the world. These statements make it clear that what went on before this creation did matter and do affect mankind now. In the same way, what is accepted in this life by one's heat and diligence affects what comes after. This current course of life has been ordained by God and is one eternal round. 
even if one has proven before, he must prove himself again now. God has been at this a long time. Christ has been involved in many repeated cycles of creation. God's great work has been going through cycles of creation, fall, redemption, judgment, and recreation forever. It is endless. Many unnumbered worlds have been, now are, and will yet be. This is a continual, endless cycle, worlds without end. Ever notice how the pre-earth and the millennium seem alike? Ever wonder what worlds without end means? Ever consider how God's world work never ends, yet it has definite increments separating one cycle from the next? God's works are endless. We are his greatest work. He intends to give us immortality and eventual eternal life. How long it will require depends on how long it takes us to become like the prototype of the saved man. <clears throat> when I read that, um, in thinking about this parable, I saw a lot of, you know, it, it just seemed to fit in the overarching theme of this parable. I have a comment, Brad. Yeah. I love what Lisa had to say about how for her, this has been kind of a progression for her, but I'd, I'd like to offer a different way of looking at it, kind of along some of the lines of what you said. I think kind of with our LDS background of three kingdoms of glory, we tend to look at celestial is down at the bottom and terrestrial is higher than that and celestial is what we're aiming for. And um, I think if we, if we look at hope as kind of more of a terrestrial mortality and tar water as more of a celestial mortality, I think from an LDS standpoint, it's easy to say, oh, well, we're down here at this celestial and we're trying to become more like hope and better and more terrestrial. But ultimately, I think from what we've learned um, more recently, a celestial experience like we have right now does not come along very often. And the opportunity for growth from a celestial experience is so much more than the opportunity for growth from a terrestrial experience. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like we have opportunities for terrestrial experience much more often. And so while we may think that tar water's down here and hope's up here, it may actually be switched. It might be that hope is here. And in order to actually attain something higher, we really have to come to the tar water experience to really understand what's going on down here to be able to, to jump higher. Yeah, to jump high, it's like the slingshot effect, right? You have to be pulled down lower to 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 get up to a higher plane. So, Lori, would you say that um, Lance going to the top of the hill? Because James didn't go to the top of the hill, correct? But I, James had to go to the bottom, or Lance went to the bottom, and then he went to the top so he could see. Right. Yeah. I think that there's other other uh, instances um, in Lance's story that also. Are a, are a nod towards this, not just the fight with the bear. Had James encountered a bear, James dies. Yeah. Lance was prepared enough to actually overcome, and next time, if he encounters a bear again, he already knows how to overcome again. There's great knowledge there. There's far more knowledge there than James has. Lance descends down. He also climbs up to the top. He... Well, I, I'm sure Brad will get to it, but he, he has to go through a, a, a redemption process, if you will. Yeah. Even if something as simple as, I'm on page 57 now, just a few paragraphs after where you stopped. Yeah. It's talking about Lance. He's, um, it, it, I think it's. How about you just read that part, Cameron? Yeah. Now, because of the cloudy sky, Lance's journey was changed from arching to a straight line. This is where, I, where I'm reading now, it's at the top of 57. When the mark on the trees is still faintly visible from the distance, he cut another mark on the same side of a new tree. After stripping the bark, uh, cut two ax marks below it to signify this was the second of his marks. 
you know, it, it's interesting that he goes into such detail to talk about how he's tracking something. Mm -hmm. And then when he was six marks away, he, he was effectively seven rungs away from where he knew he could get back to where he needed to go. I, I think that there's symbolism all over the place in this journey, in this, what we look at as, as a lesser existence or a more menial or, or a fearful path. I think that there's, that there's such symbolism here that we co totally gloss over, not even realizing the importance of we have an opportunity. I should say Lance has an opportunity to, to ascend much higher, return with much more knowledge than does James. Well, and where did he use the words cutting and marking? Cut, cuts and marks is quite... So, so well, Ken, if you start at zero, right, and you go to six, then he's seven up. But I also looked at it, and, and when Adrian and I were talking, it, or did he stop short of seven? And, and that's just something to consider, right? Six typically is not a very, um, let's say, celestial number, uh, symbolic in a good way. Well, uh, but six marks, right? You're gonna make a, you're gonna make the first mark, and then you're gonna travel some distance where you can still see the mark, mm -hmm. and make the second mark, and you're gonna travel again. Yeah. And seven, the seven. sixth mark you make, you don't stop there. You're gonna travel until as far as you can still see the sixth mark. You have traveled seven distances. That's true. What if you start on the top rung of the ladder and you go six marks down and then you standing on the ground? And now you're gonna reverse that process and your hope is that when you get all the way back up and you begin at the bottom and work your way back up as Joseph Smith said, then when you get there, you keep going and you're now able to progress from that sixth rung on the ladder to the seventh, and maybe even to get off the ladder completely, which is kind of the next stage. Yeah, there, it, I, I find Lance's journey riddled with these type of, of symbolisms. If you look at the content in the parable of that that's about Lance's journey versus James. We've got five pages just Lance and two pages maybe of James. So, you know, if you look at it from, well, this is like all negative. It's like, why are we spending so much time on Lance's journey? I think there's more to it than, than maybe the first read or two. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I had these thoughts a while ago when we were reflecting on the names, um, that have been so carefully chosen here and, um, Lance, according to the dictionary is a long weapon for thrusting and, um, or use for charging something. Um, and I find it interesting that he, um, I did too take note that most of the story is about his experience, um, the knowledge that he has and how to survive in the danger because he is in a dangerous world. Um, but he has the knowledge in order to be able to, to overcome that. And through that knowledge and through the seemingly negative, but perhaps just the, the, the difficult situations he continuously finds himself in, He's gaining more and more knowledge. I find it interesting that the other person in Tarwater, or excuse me, in Hope, his name is James. And who is it in the scriptures that taught us that if any of us lack wisdom, we should ask God? It was James. Lance enters the wood, and one of his weapons is stealth, and James enters the wood with a scroll. And I just I just took note at their different approaches, um, and I just thought that the names and the things that they took with them was interesting. Yeah, very very interesting, right? Uh, Lance has has uh, stealth. He also carries a bow and arrow. James has a bag and a scroll. 
I, I think, hey, I think one of the keys to this is making sure you don't make one as a good guy and one's a bad guy. Exactly. They're both exactly. good people. Yeah. They're both doing the best they can with the knowledge they've been given. Exactly. And, and, and doing and, and excelling. Both of them are excelling in what they've been, what they've been trained. Right. And, oh, I was going to, one quick thought with the scroll. <clears throat> it's interesting who James was and him writing these words of wisdom on the scriptures as the scriptures and the scrolls perhaps could symbolize um, gaining that wisdom. Um, I agree that these are both worlds that are, I think, equally important and have uh, crossover with um, characteristics that we need in both worlds. Um, I, I just saw the parallel with his name, James, with, with having the scroll and with what the scriptures teach us uh, about having wisdom. Um, and if this, is, if this represents the feminine side, I don't know. Well, it, it's interesting. I, I, I kind of see this right where, you know, you have a child of hope who, you know, if you look at it from the feminine uh, carries a lot of wisdom, but scroll, I think having scripture or it, it kind of shows this knowledge aspect where, you know, Jay, Lance, he has a lot of knowledge of the wood, but he's hopeful. He's hopeful about things. Uh, he's hopeful that the bear doesn't eat him. Maybe that's the wrong type of hope, but um, I, I, I liked your comment, John, that uh, neither of these, we should say you're wrong you're right. They, they both carry a tradition. They both have this mortal experience um, or this experience through their rounds of eternity. Um, and, and they both have things that will, they'll carry with them um, back to their existences, back to, uh, you know, the next step in progression. Brad? Yeah. Um, so what else is interesting is that God is mentioned in here, and the yeah. one time he's mentioned, it's that he actually taught Nimrod how to create a very effective arrow. Now, we don't necessarily think of God as being warlike, but, you know, what God did in that case was teach Nimrod and then subsequently all the descendants, the people of Tarwater, mm -hmm. uh, what they needed to know, because God knew that they would be encountering these things in the woods. And so what Lance was given by God uh -huh. and, and subsequently by the people that, that outfitted him for the journey was the correct stuff. He was given the bow, the arrow, the quiver, and a knowledge of certain things. And you'll notice if you read through, it says he instinctively, he knew what would happen if he did this? He knew what would happen if he did that against the bear, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you know that stuff? Where did that come from? What? How was he prepared for this wood experience? And then how does that preparation contrast with what Hope had? Hope was also properly prepared for those woods. Hope was given the right tools to accomplish the task at hand, and that would have been a bag and an understanding of seeds and a scroll to collect not just food but also wisdom and bring that back. And I, I really, the, the more I've pondered this, the more I felt like the woods, even though Denver has said that the, the woods are, you know, Lance found in the forest what he was looking for, and Hope found in the forest what Hope was looking for. Well, that is true, but if you kind of set that aside for a minute, the, if you consider that the experience is, in fact, materially different. I mean, there was no bear in the Woods of Hope, right? There was no uh, threat like that there. The threat had long ago kind of moved away because bears yep. just don't really like the smell and company of humans and all that. So this is a, this is, this is not a risky threatening place. And so there was no need for that kind of armament to go in. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is 
the, I think the woods are different. The experiences are different. And maybe um, what we're, one of the things that we can learn here is that God has given and does give to each of us the armament or the tools or the, the necessary things that we need in order to learn what we need to learn in this experience. Lance was not sent into the woods of hope and hope was not sent into the James. woods of Lance. Sorry, J uh, James was not sent into the woods of, of tar water. Um, they were sent to the correct place. They were given the correct things and they ended up learning the correct things. And that's exactly what God wanted to have happen. Thanks, Reed. Did you have something to say, huh? I thought my wife had a comment, but she doesn't. I, I have a comment. Um, I have a comment too. <laughs> Go ahead. Going along with this uh, idea that maybe Lance experienced as a T. Lestial uh, probation and James experiences a terrestrial probation. In this civilization talk in Grand Junction, Denver taught that the same animals, bears and wolves, which are menacing and threatening in a telestial environment, yeah. uh, can be uh, allies uh, and friends and even family in a terrestrial environment like Zion. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I actually had um, something right here from that, um, that that I'd like to read. Um, so thanks for bringing that up, Kay. It says, The scriptures speak of an idyllic time, in the beginning when man and nature were entirely at peace with one another. The scriptures also foretell of a coming idyllic age, when that peace is restored again. Why do we accept these bookends as true without ever considering the role of man? in destroying the original peace? Why do we assume we have no obligation imposed upon us to reform creation back to the original? The prophecy of Isaiah is not magic imposed by God on a reluctant creation. That's talking about the lamb, you know, shall, shall sit with the lion and, and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. A uh, leopard shall lie down with the kid. That's from Isaiah. <clears throat> and he says, uh, the, you know, the prophecy of Isaiah is not magic imposed by God on a reluctant creation. It will require shepherds to care for creation. So, you know, you look at this parable, and James was more that shepherd-type role as he, you know, saved the fawn from, uh, from danger, right? Um, kind of an interesting uh, little story there. Um, but what are, what are you guys, so thanks for bringing that up, McKay. Anybody have comments about that? McKay, did you want to say more about that? I kind of butted in and, and, and oh, hey, I want to say um, already, so I'm glad I'll you make, it up. I'll make one other comment, uh, mostly as an observation, and then let somebody else figure out what it means. The Lance and James enter the forest at the same time and they're in the meadow the same time, right? Have you guys talked about this? Uh, a little bit. Um, 24 hours or so passes in, in uh, James' timetable and two or three days pass in. Right, there's a, there's a time. Right. Issue, right. And we, the, time passes differently if we're talking about men's time, prophets' time, angels' time, and God's time, according to the book of Abraham. Yeah. So, so that's, you know, if, if it is the same wood, you know, Reed was talking about, maybe we look at it, maybe it's a different wood. But if it is the same wood and they've entered at the same time, um, perhaps... You know that's a good point that maybe maybe time just goes differently for them, and I I something to consider. They both experience the same rainstorm, right? They both have to deal with the rain, so I think that would indicate to me at least that it's the same. And, time. and, and also, right, you have this shepherd uh, role, this shepherd uh, character uh, James, um, that uh, goes around picking pine nuts out of pine cones, uh, not only for food, but also for keeping the meadow pure, right? Keeping the forest from overtaking this clearing. And Lance uses 
a clearing in uh, reorient orienting himself to a high place, a high point it talks about. Um, so it's interesting that the shepherd, not only, not only does he save this fawn, which we can talk about more, uh, but he, this civilization has kind of a, a role of keeping that meadow clear. And it uh, serves at least this son of Tarwater in, in providing a clearing where he can reorient himself to a high point to, to eventually find his way back. Uh, any, anyone else have thoughts on, on that? Uh, One other thing, Brad, you know, it's interesting when you talk about uh, the different roles. Hey, hey Reed, yeah. Reed, one second. Marin, I think, has been wanting to talk a couple of times. So I'm going to give her an opportunity. Marin? This might have been beaten a little too much, but, you know, going back to Lance's name, in, in the scriptures, names tend to be very descriptive of their role on earth. And as has been said, a lance is a weapon used against charging, but it's also the ideal weapon to deal with bears. You hold it low to the ground, and as it's charging, you dig the butt end in the dirt, and then the bear, right before it gets to your reach, pushes itself through the lance. Mm. So his name is very descriptive of, of his journey through the woods, of, of trying to avoid the bear or deal with the bear. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Marin. Back to you, Reed. So we're going to point out two, two reasons why I think that maybe the uh, tar water experience is more of a telestial or you know, what we are experiencing now. Uh, one is that the passage of time uh, is different than, uh, and so there's a lot more happening a lot longer time elapses from our perspective here than elapsed for uh, Lance, or for James, I mean. And so James might be on a more terrestrial, in other words, a slower timetable. And then the second thing is the fact that, um, that Lance had to climb the mountain up to the top so that he could get a clear view of things. Um, that to me is analogous to going up to the mountain of the Lord's house. In other words, going to a temple. And the temple is designed to give that clear view. And what is it that he saw? He saw, oh, there's home. That's where I need to go. And Denver has repeatedly said that what we need to learn here in this existence is how do we walk back to God? What is the path to get back to God? And the only way that you can learn that is by going up to the mountain of the Lord's house and being taught that in a temple. And so that is what Lance did to be able to find his way back. And that's something we all here must do. Yeah. 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 That, that, uh, his, his travel, his experience, his walk in the woods, um, I think there's a lot to be gained, a lot, a lot more detail we could go into. I do want to end by 9:30, but um, I, I think it, 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 uh, I think there's value in reading that journey, um, both both men's journeys over and over. Um, there's, you know, just in, in the, you know, in in some of the the uh, quotes that I shared today, there's a lot of tie-ins in the scriptures. There's a lot of tie-ins of, of the words that, that have come forth in the restoration through Joseph and Denver. Um, there's just a lot to this parable. Um, so. Hey Brad, I, I want to, one thing that keeps entering in my mind, and that is if I were either one of these sons, parents, I'd be proud of both of them. Right? Yeah. They, they, they both did what they went there to do, both of them. And, yeah. and it, it, no matter how you want to look at it, whether one was terrestrial, one was a telestial life, um, they both did what they were sent to do. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, some, something that I'm going to pick on you, Gary Gibson. Um, Gary, Gary and I've been talking about this parable a little bit, huh? I'm used to it. Okay. Um, something that that Gary brought to my attention 
is that when it talks about when James refers to his town, he says, James walked along, it says, James walked along a path from hope, which led into the woods, hoping to find new food to gather and share with his family. And when James talks, or when Lance, it talks about Lance, it says, Lance moved with care, his bow ready to set in flight his arrow. He intended to bring meat back for his village. Right, family and village. It's it just kind of an interesting thing. Does anybody have any comments uh, about, well, I think Gary has some opinions about why the difference. Yeah, I think it's a fa there's a covenant relationship with the, the people of hope. It's like the family of God. So the village might be less, less of a relationship, less of a tight relationship. Yeah, perhaps. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, Lance's journey couldn't get him closer to that covenant relationship. You know, but, but the, the existence he came from maybe, maybe isn't as uh, familial, as, as tight-knit of a... Uh, well, well, it looks like it did. If you look at, if you look at Lance's journey in, in the big scope, it looks like it might just have done that. Yeah, I mean, he he saw his village with the smoke coming up, the pillar of smoke, right? And then, and then if you if you uh, oh, I had a thought and it just slipped my mind. I'll come back to it if I think of it. It's to me all the time. Uh, Nathan, I don't know. <laughs> What's up? Hey, I don't know if you guys have talked about this. I I tuned in just a little late. Um, did we talk about uh, Denver's parable or vision of um, waiting on the Lord to take you safely around the beast rather than? No, but um, that, that's something that's been brought to my attention in talking this over with, with some people. Uh, would you share your thoughts on, on how it ties to that, perhaps? Yeah. So I guess as I've been listening to the discussion, the thought occurred to me, well, how come um, Lance can't be a celestial being, have a celestial experience, and uh, James could be a terrestrial being, have a terrestrial experience, um, both at the same time, you know, and they're both learning and growing on this eternal progression. Um, Lance, you know, he's, he's on edge, not to be a, not to throw out a pun, but um, he's like, constantly fretting you know like oh what's going to eat me um and he eventually has to encounter a beast and run for his life um he almost gets overtaken yeah he doesn't he's successful but um compare that to the piece of james who's you know caring for everything and almost happy-go-lucky you could say he doesn't have to encounter a beast. Um, I guess if he did, I don't know what the outcome would have been, but um, I always think about, like when I see two people arguing or, or there's a fight of some sort, I always think to myself, why, why fight? Like, just go separate ways, you know? There's no reason to just like contend and butt heads. It's like, it doesn't do anything. Um, and if you look at it in the light of this parable, right, if they would have met, I wonder if they would have fought, but it's, it's not that one's right and the other's wrong. They both have different viewpoints and different traditions, right? They have different experiences. Yeah. So I guess I was just putting myself in Lance's shoes and, and thinking, okay, Lance, like you encountered this bear and you have to run for your life. What if you would have just avoided, like you wouldn't have had any of that fret, any of that adrenaline, any of that running for your life, you would have had peace. Um, anyway, just a couple of thoughts. Well, that's but, you know, in relation to that, but it says in there, the reason the bear got attention to Lance was because Lance was carving the trees, how to get his way back to home. So well, it's not like, he was being a nitwit out there banging around in the forest and attracting the bear. 
he attracted the mayor because he was doing what he was supposed to do. Yeah. Good. Good question. Would Lance have had the experience of finding a clearing, getting to a high point, and reorienting himself, almost an ascension, were it not for the run-in with the bear? Well, it begs the question of what these animals are, right? Because at the beginning of the parable, when it talks about the different animals, it describes lions and wild boars, right? As animals that potentially injure, but it describes the bear as, as something that kills, mm -hmm. right? Which is obviously different. It just makes me wonder if, again, in this celestial life, if you are ascending to the levels that you need to, if you are inevitably going to encounter the bear, per se. Yeah, and the bear that you're going to encounter here is probably not going to eat you, but it may take your soul, right? <laughs> well, if you if you don't know how to, if you're not trained and don't have the knowledge of how to protect yourself, right? But if you look at it as spiritual approach, yeah, it, it's, mm. yeah, yeah. If you take this as all spiritual, that was a battle between Lance and an and, and adversary, right? I find it interesting too that in Lance's world, he needed to be destructive in order to save himself. Everything he did was from a destructive point of view, mm -hmm. even marking the trees so that he could find his way back. I mean, he went into the woods with the intent to destroy life so that he could feed his, his village. Everything in his viewpoint was destructive, but it was necessary for his survival. And then you look at James and his world, there was no need to destroy anything, but he wasn't also faced with the dangers either. So his world was more edifying. Neither one was right or wrong, they're just different. I, I, I just, I took note the first time I read this that Lance was destructive throughout his journey. Um, because he needed to be. <laughs> I was I was reminded thinking. I had a thought real quick. Go ahead, Tiffany. And we'll go to Cameron. Okay, sorry. I had a little bit of a lag, so sorry That's about that. Okay. We'll go. Um <laughs> my thought was was how often do we feel like we're out doing what we're supposed to do, like Lance was, only to have a big obstacle come in our way to realize, oh we need to do this. It seems like throughout our whole journey here, um, we could be going down a path and then there's a big obstacle, a big bear that comes and helps us recognize, okay, I need to go this way or I need to go and change what I'm doing in order to ascend higher or in order to gain more. I, I completely agree. Um, there have been some huge turning points in my life that have come because of large, you know, terrible um, circumstances. So Cameron, what were yeah, you Yeah, I was just going to comment to kind of along those lines. Um, and and uh, then I have a question for you, Brad. But okay. the comment, uh, thinking about temple ceremony, um, part of the requirement or, or the, the appeal of taking uh, partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge was that your eyes will be opened and that you will have uh, a better understanding of some things like virtue and vice, uh, sickness and health, um, pleasure and pain. In, in reading this, you don't understand fully the pleasure until you have the, the pain uh, I, I think that, that Lance understands more the, the safety that he experiences because he's encountered the danger. Uh, and I think that there's an important aspect to that to, to, to some extent. Uh, but the question that I have for you, Brad, is Lance goes into the forest to hunt and he spends his time and eventually he gives up and he's leaving. Mm -hmm. He's on his way out. He's on his way back home. He's done. He's, he's given up. Mm -hmm. And it's not until this point that he encounters the bear. Yeah. Why, why do you, what do you make of that? Why do you think that is? It, 
it's a, I, I've thought about that, but I haven't come up with an answer. Um, it, I find it very interesting that he thinks his journey is over. Uh, he thinks he's, you know, he's, he's almost giving up. Um, that, you know, maybe, maybe there have been times where we've uh, become complacent. We think we're done, right? Maybe that's when the Lord sees fit to inflict man and uh, humble him, turn him back and give him an opportunity to ascend instead of just sitting there. You know? Just a thought. What are other thoughts on that question? I had a thought, as you were talking, Brad, I had the thought, you know, it's really interesting that for many of us, we've come out of an LDS tradition where we walked into the forest and we, we made the marks on the trees and, and, and we took all of the steps. We did all of the things that we were supposed to do. And <laughs> it's kind of like we all kind of got out there to a certain point and then it was kind of like, now what do I do? Mm -hmm. Nothing's happening. I'm not finding what I needed to find. And, you know, it was in, it was in that moment then when he turned around, maybe almost with really God, I've done, I've done everything you told me to do. I don't know where I'm supposed to go with this. I'm, I'm not bringing food home to my family, I guess. And, and it was in that moment then that the bear comes and the chase starts and fear and, yeah. and the, the you know the the running around and the fighting and and the you know holy shit what am i going to do now um that finally takes him to the top of the mountain well and it's it's you know sometimes we may enter we may go through life and, and have a certain goal <laughs> but it's not where the lord wants us to be um, I was going to go somewhere else with this. And I just had a brain fart. Um, you know, um, someone else had a thought while I try to reconnect, collect my thoughts here. Um, I'm just wondering how much he was actually following the commandments of God. I think yeah. that if you're following the commandments of God, you're going to be taken through difficult times no doubt. And those experiences will get you to where you need to go. But he was marking the tree so he could see his way back. Why was it the spirit guiding him? Why wasn't he using more of the spirit to help him understand how he was supposed to take care of what he was supposed to do? Um, I came across this one quote here in one of these books about a Native American um, their ideal, and it says, the goal of life for most Native Americans is to reach old age with wisdom and understanding, understanding of the connections possible between male and female, man and his fellow man, man and nature, and finally, man and the cosmos, a cosmos with a divine center. Ideally, the end of all our changing is to come to a stage in development where we can say, I have created something divine out of the experiences of my life. So I, I think that's what we're actually talking about. We're talking about two people who are on a different path, and the reason they are is because they were somewhere else on the cycle when they got here. One of them had been a little further ahead on the cycle than the other one, but the other one was going to get there. It just He was just learning how to get there and in those experiences he would eventually find his way but not without a lot of error and maybe going to the wrong church or you know whatever it is they had to overcome to get on the path and find out what God was actually telling them to do so they could truly obey the commandments so that that could actually help you to progress to it to, in the end, be in the zone, in the connection, and be in, in total alignment with what God wants you to do. That, then you're just like, okay, Lord, what's next? You're not even worried about what your life would be or what you're supposed to do with your life. You're just asking God, okay, God, what do you want me to do next? You don't have any of those ideas. You don't have any of those thoughts. You're just waiting to find out the next thing 
the next commandment so that you can go out and try to do the best thing you can with what he's asking to do and what he gives you to work with. Uh, but that's, that's my comment. So Cameron, back, back to you, you asked me a question um, and I answered it terribly. So what are your thoughts on, you know, what's your answer to that, to that question? What, what does that symbolize that Lance was out hunting? He, the cloud cover comes in. It's, I think it even start. I'm not sure if it started raining at that point, but he's like, this is, this is a failed hunt. I'm going, I'm heading back. What is, what, what does that symbolize to you? Yeah, I think that, um, I, I liked Lori's comment about how for her it was, she was doing everything she was supposed to do. And at the point where she had given up on the church, um, well, so I'll, I'll phrase it for me. I, I don't think it necessarily needs to be tied to the church or our experiences religiously. I think that, I think that in my experience, I go through things and I, I, I have an idea or I set out on a project and I'm going to go do as much as I possibly can. And once I get to the point where I can't do anything more for myself, I'll give up or move on to what's next. And it's, and it's that moment when in my experience, God steps in and intervenes. That's when either I need to keep going and he's going to make that path available for me, or I need to, to radically change to something else and he's going to send a bear to chase me. So I run in the direction that, that is completely not where I would naturally go myself, but puts me in a position to, uh, as to encounter what God needs me to encounter. Right. It makes me think, you know, that changing direction, it may not be, you know, what was in your plan, but that new direction makes me think of kind of a repentance, right? Changing the path you're on to, to where you actually need to go. Yeah. No, well, not, not only that, but with, with the idea of, I have a... it reminds me of um, Denver and his, he was like, okay, I'm going to retranslate the, the book of John. And he did all that he could, and he tried to do it. He tried to have someone else translate it, and he tried to do it himself, and it was going to happen. But in the end, the Lord was like, okay, this is what you actually need to do, and gave it to him once he had gone through all of that and gotten to the point of giving up. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Annette. Um, Mike Newmeyer, I think you were trying to make a comment. Yeah. Um, so kind of tying another parable in with this, the parable of uh, the busy young man on his way. Um, if you think about that parable, and um, ultimately the young man spends many, many years tying the net with the master. If you think about the end result of that net, though, a net is generally used for fishing to go out and catch fish, but it never actually says that that net was used for that purpose. Yet... The whole process of creating the net fulfilled its purpose, and that was to allow the young man to spend time with the master and to, um, and to learn and to grow and to do as he needs. So this journey into the wilderness for this hunt, he might get to a point where he feels like, um, you know, I failed. He may even get back to his village and feel, feels like he failed to bring home um, meat for them. But ultimately... Um, our journey, as long as we're walking with the master, um, it doesn't matter that in the end, the net isn't actually used to take out to go fishing. Um, the net served its purpose. The journey served its purpose. The hunt served its purpose. And it was, um, or our journeys here as we walk our paths, whatever it is, um, they serve our purpose as long as we're, as I think, trying to, uh, learn from the master and and walk with him as we go um, they're purposeful even though to us they might at times seem like we failed or seem like uh, the idea behind the trip was was not we didn't accomplish what we set out to do yeah um, <clears throat> thanks for sharing that Mike um, you know 
the last couple of comments, you know, it, this, this journey that, you know, he thinks he's going to go hunting, bring back game. He expected to find danger. He does. Um, his journey then really takes off when he's being chased by this bear. The point that he actually loses the bear, it says this on page 61. It says he was, um, Lance, however, was moving quickly beyond the valley, changing directions to conceal his retreat. It was many hours later before he rested for the first time. By then, the rain had stopped, and he could listen again for the sound of any movement behind him. And it says this, and I just find it interesting that it says he was well, alive, and perhaps even now safe from his dangerous pursuer. But he was lost, and it was getting dark. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what that means, but I just think it's really interesting that it, it points out that he's alive, safe, and well. But then it talks about him being lost. And then, you know, uh, I want to start wrapping up a little bit that um, he's lost and he realizes this. And the knowledge that he has um, is that most of the time he's orienting himself using the sun. Now, at this point in his journey, it's... Uh, been raining, the rain stops, but it's cloudy and he can't orient himself. And so um, <clears throat> he has to find, he knows he has to find a clearing and he finds himself a meadow. Um, it, you know, in the story of James, a lot of his story talks about the meadow and how he spends his time clearing it. What could the meadow represent? It, you know, for me, this is the point in time where you've got to you've got to go from the ten thousand uh, foot high view to the thirty thousand foot, and and, for, and look at this as a completely spiritual discussion. Nobody was going hunting. Nobody was going to collect pine cones. Okay. Oh Neither yeah, one. I know. Yeah. So it's what totally is different? Yeah. What is the spiritual aspect? Yeah, I mean, just like just like I saw somebody bring up on the chat the the story of the uh, Enos. You know, the the yeah. story wasn't him going out hunting bees. The story was he had to go out and pray. Yeah. And, and I think he, he, once you get to this point, you can now look at these stories and think about it from that perspective, and then turn everything in from the bear to the pine nuts to, to the meadow, all turn it now into a spiritual pers perspective, the high point, all of that. Now make that spiritual and all of a sudden you got a whole new, whole new story. Right. Brad, can I uh, throw something else out here? Sure. Thank you. Does it have to do with the meadow? It, it does not really have to do with the meadow. Well, yeah. Okay. You Sorry, can not try to that was my down. question was about the meadow. Uh, um, I just I had a thought while while I was pondering this and while we've been talking, the thought is what? Why don't we look for the Savior in this? Mm. Where do we find the Savior in each of the two experiences? And I can tell you exactly where I think we find the Savior with Lance, and it is with the paragraph that starts, he found a rock outcropping, mm. which allowed him to change directions yet again, mm. and it was certain his dart concealed, his dart meaning his change of directions, not his arrow. Right. His dart concealed him before the bear reached the hilltop. This was very hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if you consider that the Savior is the cavity of the rock, and that's where we go. If you remember Denver's dream, the, you find the safety in the cavity of the rock. In this case, that's what he did. He found a rock outcropping that allowed him to do what? Change direction. To change direction. Yet again. Mm -hmm. Given it all up for the Lord once. 
And now I'm going to give it all up for the Lord again, says Denver, right? Mm. And it changed directions yet again. But this time, he was certain. He had something that he didn't have before. He gained something in that outcropping of the rock and that helped him to change direction. He found certainty. And that was very hopeful. Yeah. And so I really see that this is a, a series of allusions to the process of being saved, the process of coming to the Savior, getting to change directions, and now take on a whole new journey, this time with the knowledge that the course that you're pursuing is, in fact, what the Lord would have you do, which is part of the lectures on faith, if you recall. That is the final step. You, there are the three things. You have to have, you know, knowledge of the character attributes and perfections of God and so forth. But the, 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 the last of those is an actual knowledge that the course that you're pursuing is what the Lord would have you do. So now he has that with this paragraph. He was certain, and this was hopeful, which then ties me back to hope. Where is the Savior in that story? And I can, I just, the thought struck me that now we have an inverse relationship. Who is the Savior? Well, it's James. Because he is from hope. He is hope. And what he does is he rescues the fawn that is completely defenseless against both any bear or any other animal that's out there that might take it and or any other hunter or man that's out there, which uh, may have been there and might have been a thing, but might have not been. But nonetheless, now the, the character, the main character is performing the role of the savior. What's interesting is... You know, we've gotten to that point where it says, uh, you know, you talked about James saving the fawn. Um, at the last of page 64, it says, but the fawn needed care, and so James was grateful to repay a debt owed to the forest. Um, what could that debt be? Was was? Uh, I wonder what Christ owes his father. His father saved him. Yes, yeah, so I wonder what Christ owes his father because his heavenly parents made the forest for him so that he could become the savior. And now he has a chance to return the favor or pay it forward or however you want to use well, it in today's parlance. It, it's interesting when the when the fawn when the fawn stands up and. He, you know, he picks up the fawn, then then another guy at the end of the forest comes in with a bow, right? Could have he been a hunter in a previous round that killed a fawn? And this is him, you know, could be that type of scenario as well. Illustrating the relationship. Repaying a debt that, you know, owed from a previous cycle. Um, and, and to Reed's comment, it, it makes me think that, you know, Lance will require physical protection, but James would receive spiritual protection. So it kind of, again, delineates the difference between a terrestrial, celestial, and a telestial type individual there. That's what, what it reminded me of. Yeah. Um, do we have any other comments? I, I, the, there's a lot more we, we could cover. I, I did want to keep it just about an hour and a half. Um, we could probably have, a, you know, two or three more series on this one parable. Um, anybody else uh, have, have like something you were going with the, Just take a few minutes. I like where you were going with the uh, questions about the meadow. Uh, John points about the, the, the spiritual aspect and the, the even higher view of things, the even more metaphorical. I, I agree. I think there's a lot more there and it's representative one way or the other of, of everyone's journey. Um, yeah, it, we could talk much more. We could talk more about the timing, uh, the days and the nights that are very clearly delineated mm -hmm. and that don't match. We mm -hmm. assume that they encounter each other. They do not. Or if they do, then the days are off. They're off by an entire day. There, there's a lot we could talk about. We could talk about it, maybe move the uh, move the conversation online. 
if uh, if you want to end now, Brad. Yeah, I'd 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 very much like that. Um, you know, there was a a lot more I wanted to share as well. Um, I I would you know if you're interested in 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 looking more at maybe what this parable could mean and um, you know we read that uh, glossary of terms uh, that term from the glossary of terms called uh, worlds without end. It, at the end of that, it takes you to the term for ever for space ever. I would, I would recommend that you read that. And also there's a glossary term called mansion. Um, very interesting. Um, how that might tie into, into this parable. So, um, thank you all for, for your thoughts and, and, and for helping me, uh, you know, get through this thing. So appreciate it. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for leading the discussion and uh, thanks everybody for participating. I, I, uh, yeah, I think I, I really hope that this does move over to the, to the forum and that we, we start having some longer discussions about a lot of this stuff. I think there's a lot there. Um, I've got more questions than answers and I'd love <laughs> to have more uh more perspectives uh from it so i will uh maybe i'll go post some questions there to perhaps get the ball rolling so uh thanks again brad